you guys think. Just, uh, yes. Just, just bring it on down. Bring it on. <laughs> and now it's not picking up the game. Ah! <laughs> oh, oh yes. Yes. That gives me the opportunity to bring up Pepe, if I may. Oh, sure. Go for it. Pepe. Pepe. Pepe, he's a king prawn, okay? He he's mm -hmm. uh he's one of the newer characters on the Muppet Show. He was introduced on Muppets Tonight, which was the second version of the Muppet Show, which was mm -hmm. back in the 90s, and it was actually really good, so I was very very sad that I got canceled. But so, yeah, I'm a little uneasy with uh, a lot of what's happening in the new Muppet Show, but what I do like is there's an episode where uh Josh Groban is the guest. Yes. Ooh. Josh Groban, if if you folks listening don't know who he is, he is uh, an opera singer, basically, who's yeah. really good looking. <laughs> he's, oh, yes. he's a very tasty little morsel. And he starts dating Miss Piggy in the episode. And so everybody's kind of sitting around the table talking about like, like wow, like, you know, th this Josh Groban guy. And Pepe says that he's a very attractive man. Or mm -hmm. that he would, or that he would date him, something like that. Yes. And everybody kind of looks at him, and he's like, "What? He's very attractive and gender is fluid, okay?" <laughs> yeah. And I just thought that was a really, yeah, like great message to be getting out in front of kids. I like that a lot. That is right? That's really, yeah. I like, I like that 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 I I saw a clip of that entire sequence because it, he's da Josh Groban's dating Piggy, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and I I like that it's there's just no question about like 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 their 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 looks or anything like it's just oh, like yeah. oh yeah like they're both they're both into each other of course like and that's just the end of it exactly yeah it's it's not a thing it's just it's just yeah this is the just way dating this right yeah. Lad ladies and gentlemen hello welcome to today's stream I apologize for our, for our brief hiccups there getting things rolling. Welcome to I Got Next. Uh, we are T minus one and a half weeks away from Halloween. I'm pretty goddamn excited about Halloween oh this God. year. Are you guys like in the spirit? Have you been have you been capturing the Halloween soul? I'm never really out of the Halloween spirit. You know me. That's true. It is, it is my favorite holiday. Oh yes. Ashley, are you there? Are you? Oh into yeah, it? I'm. I'm working my way into it more. I, I was actually thinking about this, like, the feeling of Halloween isn't necessarily, like, a scary feeling, but just kind of, like, this fun, weird, eerie feeling, and I'm working my way into that because all the neighbors are starting to decorate their houses, mm. and I'm going to go out and buy some buy some Halloween decorations and decorate our tree, just our, our Halloween tree. So today, and, today is my attempt to give decorations to everybody on the internet. This is our equivalent of putting out the jack-o'-lantern and putting yes. up the spider webs. This is this is that for us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, those voices you hear are, are uh, Ashley Reed, uh, editor at Games Radar. Hello, Ashley. Hello. And managing editor Susan Arndt. Hello, Susan. Hello, everybody. And my name is Anthony John Agnello, senior social editor here at Games Radar. Uh, back... After a little bit of a siesta, I missed you guys. Uh, and today, uh, on our show, I Got Next, our weekly talk show, we are playing Silent Hill 4, The Room. And I am currently in The Room. And the reason that we are playing The Room today is that our guest is a man named Doc Pruce. And Doc Pruce is an interesting cat. He is the producer from Scrap Scrape Entertainment, not Scrap, excuse me. Scrape Entertainment. Those different things. Who, uh, who are in charge of the escape rooms, real escape room in San Francisco, I'm New York, I'm so Chicago. excited to talk about this. Very excited to talk about this. So, have you guys done, a, like, an escape room before? Never. Never. I've all, it's, it have. is a dream of mine to do one. I really want to do one, too. I, I really want to do one. Uh, they're a lot of fun. They're they're tough though. Like the one I did was, it was very heavily puzzle based. It was basically you had to solve these puzzles to open a door, to open a box, to do all this stuff, and it was tough. Like mm. we actually didn't finish in time, 
And I like to think we're not stupid people, so we're just like, but we're still just like bumbling around trying to figure out what's going on with almost no clue. But it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm like, damn, if only we'd known about that one thing. That experience appeals to me so much. I mean, this, this game is kind of the closest thing that I have ever had to being in an escape room. Uh, if anybody watching is unfamiliar with Silent Hill 4, this is the, the very much the black sheep of the Team Silent developed Silent Hill games. Oh, honey, no, 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 no. Oh, no? No, 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 no. Book of Memories. Book of Memories isn't of by memories. Team Silent, though. Well, that, That's by okay. Way Forward. It's a Way Forward that's true. game. So I mean, like, of the people that created Silent Hill, this is their okay. black sheep. This is... So this came out right at the tail end of the PlayStation 2's life cycle, and Team Silent, having finished Silent Hill 3, were like, let's make something different that's not Silent Hill, but we want to still make a horror game. And so they made this, and it started out as its own thing. And then eventually Konami was like, nah, you should probably still call it a Silent Hill game. Uh, Which and... is really unfortunate because the part w where this differs from other Silent Hill games, in case you're unfamiliar, is that the main story is you being stuck mm. in this really nasty apartment and it's super creepy. Like you look out right? the peephole of your door and it's, it's really, really freaky just being in this confined space. Really, really wacky. But then, you know, there's a hole in the wall and you cr climb through it. And you're in Silent Hill and it's skinless dogs and it's <laughs> nurses and fog. And, you, and it's all stuff you've seen before. So you guys, you guys are going to see it uh, momentarily on the stream, Susan and Ashley. I know you guys are watching on the delay. You're a little bit behind. But, like, I'm, I'm, so I love the way the game opens because it just picks you up right in the nightmare version of the room. Right. Where everything mm -hmm. is gross and blood covered and there's like a face sticking out of the wall and it just sucks. But I, I love this part because this seems like generic horror stuff. This seems like all Silent Hill stuff. Right, like, right. oh, bloody walls, where are the nurses and dogs and things split in two? But it's not as scary as the actual room you end up right. stuck in. Which right, is just the... Empty, Can we talk creepy about this room? for a second, though? Because, okay, let's imagine for a minute that you are in a murder hotel. Yes. You a murder are tell. A, 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 mur a murder tell. It's not a motel. It's a, it's a murder tell. You go into a room and you kill somebody very, very violently. Right. That's really only, only going to impact a certain amount of the geography. Like, what do you have to do to make something this disgusting? I think you gotta be you gotta be really in committed to the idea of ghost monsters, not ghosts, not ghost monsters. monsters. You need to be committed to ghost monster. Oh, like, this is extremely unpleasant. Sorry, <laughs> the thing is climbing through the wall. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, yeah, you've got to be like this. You or, or it needs to be a Jacob's Ladder situation, Susan. Mm -hmm. And the moment after that you have actually killed somebody in the murder hotel, or the murder tell, if you will, mm -hmm. and the moment after that you've got to transition out and you're in a nightmare or hallucinatory state. Or you're in a floodplain <laughs> and the room was flooded and right. then... There's some real the... mildew problems. Exactly. You got a black mold situation and it wasn't rehabbed properly because the insurance... Here's the thing. Flood insurance is a separate thing. A lot of people don't know that. You got to get separate flood insurance. <laughs> yep. Uh, Ghost is still freaky123 in the chat here says, It sucks that the new Silent Hill didn't come out. I'm right there with you, man. I know. I wanted that pachinko machine to come out here too. I haven't, I haven't put this you idea You are past such me. a jerk. You are being <laughs> such a troll right now. You're terrible. I apologize. I, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> I, I apologize to everybody. So Ghost is Still Freaky123 also says, yeah, I played most of the Silent Hill games except for one and four. One and is I, brilliant. One is still great. One yeah. is... Oh, yeah. In fact, the technical, like, technological limitations of four, I find, or of one, rather make it even scarier now. 
to me. Like, looking at how janky everything looks and oh, how dark man. everything is and the fact that you can't see anything clearly. I, oh, oh, God, that game still freaks me out. It's still so good. The, the one thing that I think is lost on me now with Silent Hill 1, because I actually just played it earlier this year just to play it again, and it wasn't like the, it wasn't the technical stuff. That didn't even matter because it was so scary. It was the design of the monsters that was kind of not scary to me anymore. I'm like, so there's a pterodactyl and a giant moth. But, like, the monkeys, the way they move, yeah, that's freaky. So I'm freaky. like, oh, God, no. <laughs> Stay away. All right, so I'm now, I'm now in the actual room. I'm in, I'm in Henry's. Henry Townshend, you're <laughs> one of how many generic white guys? Are there in Silent Hill getting? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, six. I think there's there are Harry. six. There's Harry. Well, there's well okay. Back. Trucker dude is not that. He he kind of has his own thing. Yeah, trucker dude kind of has his own thing, but like, so, uh, yeah, uh, ex soldier in Homecoming. He's, yeah, he's right out. Yeah. There's there's direct DVD horror movie uh, white guy who's in Silent Hill Downpour. Yeah. And yeah. then that is the perfect. I am stealing that for a review. Do you like, at some do you like that? That's good. You no, like that's that? good. Direct to DVD guy. Yeah. Direct to DVD horror lead. Direct to DVD uh, stunt actor for a Universal Soldier sequel. That's a yep. very spe very specific guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, if anybody is uh, watching the stream and thinking that this is uh, not the best visual fidelity, let me tell you. It looks that sort of blurry and washed out on my television, too. We're running a, a original PlayStation 2 uh, with component cables coming out of it. And, Ooh. you know, I, I got to tell you, Silent Hill 2 and 3 for PS2 still look great coming out of this yeah. thing. I don't know what happened. 4 just doesn't... 4 just looks unfinished. It always has. It has some spectacular imagery here and there, but man, yeah. It four, I think four was an attempt to look a little more painterly. Is not quite the right word. Yeah. But. But a little bit more stylized and dream like dreamlike. Yeah, yeah dream -like. perhaps impressionistic. Maybe. Yeah. There you go. Uh, how? I, I God. Right, so this is the other thing. The I don't remember. Yeah, the control scheme when you're in the room is really weird. And there are only certain things you can do. Okay. And That's true. So right now, I thought that I was exiting the window. I wasn't just staring at that woman creepily as she went into the subway station. That was part of the scene. And now I'm looking around, and I'm going to try and get out of here. We're going to see... We're going to see the door. So, Susan, Ashley, did you guys play Silent Hill 4 when it first came out? Yes. I did not. I did not play it when it first came out. I... What year did it come out again? 2005, I want to say. Okay, so I wouldn't have been too young to play it, but I don't think I was really aware of Silent Hill yet. And Susan, you caught it right when it first hit? Oh yeah, I'm a huge, 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 huge Silent Hill fan. So, you know, one, two, three, got them as soon as they came out, played them through, uh, Silent, 2, Silent Hill 2 is still one of the scariest games I've ever played. I think it's a masterpiece. Silent Hill 3 was a little disappointing. Um, and then I got to 4, and I just stopped playing it because I was like, no, this is dumb. I'm sorry. Like, here's the thing. You can only see skinless dog so many times before you start going, hey, skinless dog, what up? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Right. And it I, was... think that's why, I think that's why 2 works so well is because the monsters were so personal to that character, and they were so weird and different and still really unnerving so i feel like that didn't that hasn't really crossed over into other silent hill games as well so well, the, i think that's the why the it problem works is so perfectly the there room plays like a silent hills greatest hits yes mm -hmm. yeah except and, and except for when you're actually in the room except for when you're actually in the room and that's that's the really creepy part and i really enjoyed that but i wasn't willing to put up with the oh and now this is where this happens <sighs> yeah. and this is where that <sighs> i was i just wasn't willing to do all that in order to play all the sequences that are actually in the room three was silent hill three was you could see it was getting there like they were just 
ringing that same bell over and over again. It worked um, in part because you were, uh, it, it very smartly changed the protagonist. Mm. So you went from mm-hmm. playing generic white dude to playing a teenage girl. So mm-hmm. immediately there, well, it Heather, the Heather remains an awesome character. She's a great character. Great, She's a great character. Love- Increases and the feeling I- of vulnerability without making her, uh, you know, like Ashley from Resident Evil 4. You know, she can actually right. do things. Right. Yeah. Um, also, Amusement Park, which is always plus 10 to creepy. And oh my God, that rabbit. What? <laughs> what? Oh my God, yes. Oh my God, that. Ugh. And I, I also actually like Silent Hill 3 because I felt at least when it gets... I, I, I won't... I want to say I won't spoil anything, but good God, that game's been out forever. Um, when it gets toward the end, it definitely comes at a kind of fear that I don't think a lot of games even touch on. You know, like when it gets to the bit where it's like, oh, you're pregnant with this demon child and you have you have to have it. It's like this deep psychological thing, at least for me, where I was like, wow, that's the kind of fear that was instilled in me. As a teenager, like, don't ever get pregnant or it'll fucking ruin your life. And this is, like, the horror version of that. So I was at least like, holy crap, they're actually doing something kind of different. Guys, so I, I appreciated to, Silent Hill 3 for that. I have to give it up to Single and Loving It here in the chat. Yeah, this, no, that, that's This amazing. guy got the ADT premium package. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. is... That's gold, perfect. Single and Loving It. That is gold. That is just perfect. This actually, this reminds me of uh, part of what creeped me out about What Remains of Edith Finch, which is a an upcoming PS4 game. Oh, it is not out yet. Yeah, it's not out yet. I was just about to say, did that nope, release? Nope, not out yet. Yeah, it's still not done. You break into your old family house, and all the doors to the bedrooms are sealed from the outside. Oof. Yeah. So you Oof. look through peepholes... You're in the hallway looking in the, pe- in the people into the room. And it's very, very creepy. It's like, what is going on in here? You know what my favorite thing about these Silent Hill games is, and it ties into that sort of, like, what the hell is going on here that you're just describing in Edith Finch, is like right there, you know, uh, Henry looks out his peephole and sees his next door neighbor and there are like blood handprints on the yep. wall behind her. And she just is like doing her laundry, whatever. And I love that. That is one of my favorite forms of horror when something is clearly wrong. And yet you are surrounded by people who are acting like everything is normal. I love that. I love that. that is- like Edith Finch, like you're, you, you're in a house that seems like it's just a house. Everything's normal. Except for all the things in your bedroom that you're going to now eat. Oh my god, that is so creepy. <laughs> that, that that is so creepy. That chapter. What? Okay, oh, so man, yeah. so you it, that to in, me? so when you you break into the house and you're trying to find out what happened to everybody there, and so you you make it into this one bedroom and you start reading this little girl's diary, and it is narrated to you in her voice. So she mm-hmm. starts telling you about. She, you know, I'm not going to be around for much longer, so I want to make sure everybody knows what happened. And she was sent to bed without any supper because she was naughty. So she starts mm-hmm. looking around her bedroom. She's starving. She's really, really hungry. So she starts looking around her bedroom for things to eat. And she eats the tube of toothpaste. And she eats some holly berries. And she eats some hamster food. But she's still hungry. So she turns into a bird. And or no, she, first she turns into a cat and then she hunts a bird outside and she eats the bird, but she's still hungry. So she turns into an owl and then she eats a bunch of rabbits, but she's still hungry. So she turns into a shark and she eats a seal, but she's still hungry. So she turns into a sea monster and she, she, start, she has all these tentacles and she finds her way onto a, a boat and she eats all the people on the boat. But she's still hungry. But now she has smelled something incredibly delicious. And so she goes up a pipe. You see her tentacles going up a pipe. And she's following this wonderful scent of something delicious. And you see that she comes out through the toilet in the room that you're in. Susan, you're saying all of this 
in perfect time with crawling through the I horrific know! portal. It's I exactly know, right? the right visual. I think that retelling might be... I haven't seen the actual thing, but I think that retelling is pretty good in and of itself. I don't know, even know if I need to play it now. Oh, it's, uh, that's just, but that's just one of the, the rooms. So I'm like, I want to know mm -hmm. where everybody else is. I want to know what else is going on. It is just freaky deaky. I'm really oh. hoping... So in just sound. five more minutes, we're going to be bringing on uh, Doc Pruce from uh, Scrap entertainment i was right the first time great it's scrap it's great. not scrape. Oh, it is scrap okay. yeah i i messed it up I, I i doubted myself i doubted my pronunciation don't second guess yourself but he's he's going to be joining us in just five more minutes and i think i really want to be able to get back to the room in this when you start to have to deal with ghosts because that's the part of this game that sucks the most and is also the best <laughs> because it's, love those. So, all those ghosts. it's so unsettling and they can't kill you it won't just like stop the game when you run into the ghosts but they're invisible like the only thing that you can tell is when they just start like screeching and everything freaks out oh, ambient God. lighting hello to you i love this silent hill well then hey man we are we are on board with you it's this funny, I, I, I kind of hate this game. I kind of <laughs> hate it. But I hate it in equal measure with how much I love it. Like, I still love playing it. Even though I'll probably never finish it again. I'll never go for the true ending again. Because, man, is that frustrating. How do I run? Is it like you have to beat it on nightmare mode kind of bullshit? No, you or... have to kill all the ghosts. That's what Okay, because I've never tried for it. Oh, it's, it's not easy. You have to kill all the ghosts. Oh, my God. Uh, Please and no. here, here is, me. as... It seems like if you're a generic white guy in Silent Hill, you're inevitably going to run into a woman who seems oddly flighty in a low-cut shirt. That's and, a, and a short skirt, yeah. It's just mm -hmm. gonna happen. <laughs> yep. It's just, and just inevitable. Just walk around, just leave. Mm -hmm. Just be like, okay, or... Alternatively, ask her to like put on a onesie or something. Like, hey, I've got this jumpsuit from my mechanic. Could you put it on? Just a just just jeans. Just a, just a sensible pair of jeans and no, a long sleeve shirt. And a long sleeve shirt. Yeah, like okay, like a hoodie and some jeans. Just a hoodie and some jeans. It'd, yeah, it'd be fine. Also, can we just can I mention that jewelry choice? Does not is not appropriate for that outfit. Nope, it's way a nope. little too fancy. It's too much. It's, it's just little, not appropriate. Little too fancy. Yeah. Uh, ambient lighting. This is the scariest Silent Hill I've played. Ah, uh, you know. Have you played Silent Hill two? Yeah, you gotta play two. Yeah. <laughs> two is upsetting. See, two, two is two disturbing. is more more disturbing than it is upsetting to me. It goes deep down. Like it, that is a a deep deep cut that it makes. It's not just scary because there are things chasing you. It's scary at its core. The Although it is scary it because there's things farting. chasing you, right? Right. Yeah. Like there's levels. Right. Mhm. Mm Man. All right. Like I feel like Silent Hill. You sit there and you go. You you look at what the main character has done and you sit there and think to yourself, Could would I have done that? And that's when it gets really uncomfortable thinking about Silent Hill too. Oh wait, our our new friend with the low cut top is gonna puke. Or she thinks she's gonna puke. I think in the world of Silent Hill, if you think you're gonna puke, chances are. Right? Yeah, well, and hey, chances are something bad. Some, something bad's about to happen to you. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Whoever you're with should just be ready to kill whatever it is that's gonna come out of your mouth. <laughs> yep. Right? Because, you know, best case scenario, it's like burrito and some slushy, and you're fine. Right. But it's far more likely it's going to be some kind of slug creature. It's, or like a full formed, like. Baby. Yeah, a fully formed baby with the head of a rabbit with fangs. Yeah, oh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Or, or your soul. Oh, I, so got, be ready. I got dog problems. I got dog, it's always the dog problems. All right, no, that dog is not feeling well. The other dogs look like they're doing okay, though. They're just checking him out. 
They got tongue issues, these dogs. Yeah. Well, there those are, are some dogs pretty good that have... Those are some, like, fruit fruit roll-up tongues right there. Hold <laughs> on, have you, have you seen those dogs? There's a breed of dog that their tongue is a little too big for their mouth, so it just hangs out the side. <laughs> oh, I have, I have not seen that. Oh, yeah, they're, so, they're like these little tiny dogs, and they just look like they're going derp at all times. <laughs> and that's, uh... Oh, I... <laughs> That's kind That's of way these cuter guys than from. these dogs. I think I think now is as good a time as any to bring in Doc. Oh, I concur. So that so that yes. he the, so the Doc can get the the complete experience. I want to know if this is an, an honorary title or or if his parents named him Doc. Well, I think I think we're going to be able to ask him right now. Hello, Doc. Welcome to the show. Hey there, guys. Thanks for having me. Now, Hello. Uh, everybody, if you are just joining us, welcome to Games Radar's weekly talk show, I Got Next, wherein we talk to people outside of the world of video games and talk to them about the very, very cool things they do. Uh, joining us right now, Doc, I have not heard your last name said aloud. I've, I've been saying it, Doc Pruce, uh. but uh, that, that's just my, my stab at it. How do I pronounce your last name, sir? Uh, you're not too far off. It's uh, Preuss. Preuss. So like an O. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, actually. There we go, everybody. This is Doc Preuss. He is a the producer of Real Escape Game, uh, which is put on in many cities by Scrap Entertainment. Uh, Doc, how the hell are you doing, man? I'm having an awesome day. I'm uh, really excited that you guys invited me over. Well, we're we're very happy to have you. We were just talking. About how Susan Arndt, our managing editor, who is also on the line, has never been through an escape room, and neither have I. I have only played video game escape rooms. Yeah. Uh, our editor, Ashley Reed, who is on the line, is a big fan of escape rooms, has not uh, been to your guys' San Francisco real escape room before, but enjoys well, the go. process. So why don't you uh, tell us tell us a little bit about what your escape rooms are. Well, let's let's back up for a second because uh, not everybody is familiar with the oh. concept. So let's just start there, start there as to what an escape room is. Yes. Good place to start. Okay. Um, so the escape room genre at its core is a room that is typically themed, uh, typically has some kind of story that goes along with it. Uh, you get a team together, uh, whether that's a group of your friends or maybe strangers that you get teamed up with, um, and then you're locked inside. Uh, we lock the door, um, physically lock it, um, and basically what your job is, uh, you, uh, depending on the room, uh, you may just take the room apart, tear everything, you know, take apart furniture potentially. Um, not all rooms offer that, but uh, and then you'll find clues that are hidden throughout the room. Uh, you'll typically find a series of puzzles, things like that. So you're basically, uh, it's kind of like the first phase is investigating and finding everything that you can. Uh, then you're trying to solve all the puzzles that you find. That's typically going to lead you to a next step and a next step. Um, some rooms are more linear than others. But your end goal is typically the same. That's going to be to find a physical key to the door that was locked behind you. Or some doors have like a, a keypad lock, so you're looking for a combination or something like that. Um, and then. They all have a strict time limit. Uh, some rooms, our rooms are all 60 minutes. I've seen anywhere from 45 to a little bit over, actually. There are there are ones that like you can get locked in overnight too, right? Really? I've seen I didn't know about I've those. seen some kinds of uh, escape type experiences. Right. Uh, I haven't seen one that's a single room that you're in overnight, but that sounds like something I would do. <laughs> So now, I have I have a question. So if they have to find a physical key and they're confined to a single room, how do you, as somebody who designed the room, make sure they don't accidentally find it by tearing stuff apart while they're looking for clues? So that's all handled within the game design. Um, there's a lot of options to um, kind of tailor that experience. Uh, some rooms are going to have mm, kind of sub rooms, I guess you could call them. Um, and others are going to be maybe gated behind something that you can't tell that it's there until you complete some sort of other objective. Okay. Um, so there are, there are kind of stages and phases to it. Um, so typically you're not going to be able to find the key just by tearing everything apart. Doc, I know that some escape rooms have people playing characters inside who 
you know, tr either are there to provide hints or sort of guide you along or to obstruct you. Do your guy, do do your escape rooms have somebody there to actively prevent people from accidentally finding the key? Uh, we do have people inside. Uh, it's not to prevent them from finding the key. Um, so it really, it kind of depends on each theme of the room. Uh, Scrap is unique in that we do have staff inside all of our rooms. Uh, a lot of the time you're going to either be put in there with a walkie-talkie or they'll have cameras on you. Uh, we do have staff inside uh, for multiple reasons. One, uh, it's just good to have really quick response should anything happen inside the room that, that needs attention. Um, there is a, a kind of a hinting process. Uh, some, some places will kind of give you limited hints. Uh, for us, because we're tailoring, we're not just building the room, we're kind of tailoring an entire adventure type experience. Mm -hmm. So it, it allows us to really um, hone in on what that flow is supposed to be and help make sure that, because we want everybody to have kind of a minimum awesome experience we know these things, you know, they're not super cheap. Um, it's kind of an outing that you get together and everybody's chipping in. So uh, we want to make sure everybody enjoys to a certain level. Um, and then we do, we do have our own set of rules. And the, having the staff inside definitely helps to make sure uh, that things don't get trashed too hard sometimes. <laughs> uh, some, people, some people get really, really into it. Uh, See, and you just gentle reminders, yeah. Right there, Doc. That is why I, wanted, I, I very badly wanted you to come on to a horror themed show with us because even though there are like i know that scrap does have their, their your chicago escape room is like werewolf themed and i know that there are like not everything is sort of themed around <laughs> horror things and monsters or that kind of setup that th there are more mundane scenarios but i think that there is something inherently scary as hell about getting locked up there is there is an in inherently terrifying well, yeah honey aspect. it's called prison yeah. well right no no, no. <laughs> i i know prison but like prison you have a reason like there's a reason well, no, you know I mean, you're it, being it is it, it it is inherently scary to be confined because yeah. your freedom is being taken away right mm -hmm. right and i i'm i'm interested in how often, like you said, you know, you need somebody on the inside in case there is an emergency. And, like, how, how do you sort of prepare for the fact that some of the people are gonna, who come in are going to freak out? They're just going to panic and freak out. And alternately, they're going to, like, panic in a way where they're like, let's just mess everything up and start destroying stuff to try well, and get wait, out. Wait, wait, wait. First of all, is, are there people who freak out in a panic situation or is it people just getting frustrated? Mm. So frustration is definitely part of the game. Um, but in terms of actual panicking, uh, people are generally pretty good, actually. They'll contact us ahead of time if they have very specific concerns uh, about things like claustrophobia. Oh, OK. Um, and, and, and we'll address those questions. But typically, our rooms are large enough to where that's right. not an issue. Um, mm -hmm. I would say more of an issue tends to be when people come in who have been pre-gaming, um, and they're just really into tearing <laughs> things apart. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, I, drunk I, people! Always yeah. with the drunk people. But we have we have had one. Oh, I can only think of one really extreme case where you know some of our games, there may be a slight horror creep out element mixed in, or there might be kind of a surprise at some. Um, and in one of our games, we very unfortunately uh, had a woman who, at a surprise point, uh, I from what I heard, we maybe triggered some PTSD from a prior oh, life experience. No. Um, but we handled it and, uh, you know, everybody's very understanding and there, it wasn't an issue in the end, um, but that was one unfortunate case. But typically people come in, uh, especially people who've never done it before, they will get frustrated in maybe like the mm. first half. Mm. And because they're just not used to doing this sort of thing. So a lot of it is kind of, you're like retraining your brain um, and you see people do better and better the more they play. But uh, once they start solving some of the puzzles and kind of seeing how things fit together, that frustration just turns into, they just start to really enjoy it. Um, and it's awesome when you see, because we'll bring in people, our team, or our, our games are 11 people um, oh, wow. for the crew. Yeah, so we're a little bit larger and there's, there are design reasons for that. Um, but a lot of the times you'll have that one person that 
organized everybody, dragged some of their friends along that said, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. And in the introduction, because we have an MC that kind of sets everything up um, before they even go in the room, and they're like, oh, I just, I'm just along for the ride. I have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people are the ones that you see them really get into it as the game goes on, and it's, it's really rewarding in that sense. So how many uh, different scenarios do you have going at any one time? Is it you come up with a, a design and that's what you run for a few weeks or months and then you move on to the next one? Or do you have several different stories and, and rooms going and, and folks can pick and choose? So this is kind of one of the areas that, that Scrap really stands out. Um, so we, have, we actually have multiple, I guess, product lines that we'd call it. Um, so we do, we do do all the rooms. We started in San Francisco, and we were the first escape room in the U.S., and we opened with the, the very original, which is Escape from the Mysterious Room. Hmm. Um, so right now, that one was retired in San Francisco, but we're running it at our partners in San Jose. So San Francisco, we've got two. It's uh, a time travel lab and the puzzle room. And then we've, we're running uh, those, the time travel lab, also in New York. Um, Mysterious Room is also over there, um, but we're retiring that one, actually, for a refresh. And then Toronto has uh, the same two, I believe, uh, Mysterious Room and Time Travel. And then on top of that, so those rooms will run basically on a permanent status. They might get switched out. It's just kind of like you let it run its normal lifespan. It might be a year, it might be two years. Okay. Uh, uh, and then as long oh. as it's still popular. So like for San Francisco, we're actually opening a second location hmm. pretty soon. So that will end up at four rooms total in San Francisco. How do but you judge what that lifespan is? How do you sort of keep... How, how do you recognize when, oh, okay, people are starting to get bored of this? Well, I mean, there's a point when you're not selling out anymore, right? Is um, that it? Like, it's, just, it's not like, oh, well, we can revitalize this somehow. There's really, like, there's an expiration date. Um, it, there are options to kind of extend, but it's also at the same time, we've got this huge back catalog. So um, some of our games, so Scrap Corporation is a Japanese company and they started the whole genre. Um, and they started that back in 2007 in Japan. Um, and so it took five years for us to open the US side, but they have this whole huge catalog. So we'll do kind of a balance of, we'll localize some of those games. So if there's something that's come out that we think would be awesome for the market, then that's something we're going to look at potentially maybe replacing something that we already have going. Hmm. Um, but we also do, we develop new content for the US as well. Um, depending on, you know, our audience and what we feel like they like to see, um, all that sort of thing. But even on top of the rooms, we do the real escape games, which are a whole other beast. Uh, you mentioned the <laughs> Chicago game, the werewolf village. So what we do with those is uh, we rent out a, an entire venue. Um, we've done it, um, like Escape from the Haunted Ship, we did on an old warship in San Francisco. Oh, God, I wanted it, to do that one so badly. Yes. <laughs> and we, we brought it to the Queen Mary in L.A., which is actually a haunted ship. Um, and then, you know, we did our Attack on Titan game in at t Park. I really wanted um, to do that, too. Yeah. 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 All, these other, that. all these other sorts of formats. So, like, we've got these big games. And we'll bring in, you know, up to 30 teams at a time. They're smaller teams. They're only six people at a time. But we've got multiple tables going. And everybody comes into this themed venue, decorated space. And they're sharing that venue while they, they you still get up and you run around. Well, you don't want to run. But you get up looking around, <laughs> looking for clues. And you're trying to solve the puzzles within your team. And there are still checkpoints. And there are staff that you tend to interact with um, as, you know, characters or checkpoints and that sort of thing. So we can take those games and just tour them like crazy. So right now we've got the Cursed Forest, which is going on. Its final stop Ooh. is LA, and that's going to start mid next week. Um, so that was like, it was San Francisco, then we went to Toronto, New York, and LA. And it's perfect timing for LA because it's the Cursed Forest, and there, it's a prince and princess story with a you know, wicked witch, and it's, it's landing right on Halloween weekend. So we're super excited nice. for that. Um, so that allows us to keep our catalog, you know, fresh and expanding all the time. Doc, so, how, uh, can you can you explain the localization process to me? I mean, so right now we're playing Silent Hill for the room, yep, which is this classic horror game and very much recognized as a, a Japanese horror series. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of 
I think, why many many fans of the originals feel that uh, Silent Hill sort of became tarnished after a certain point was that Western developers came in and sort of took it over after a certain point, and they felt that it lost some of some of the like sort of distinct national flavor uh, that yeah. that colored the originals. And I, I I find it fascinating that part of your job is is stewarding scraps escape rooms from Japan for an American audience. So what do you have to do in that process to sort of translate something? I mean, like, I look at Attack on Titan, and that's that's an international success. There's not a whole lot you have to do to sort of adjust that for, for American tastes. Mm-hmm. But I, I would imagine other mm-hmm. ones, absolutely. Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, Attack on Titan, there, that was kind of more standard localization process. We were actually able to get the... Um, like the English voice actors to do videos for us, especially. Um, but for the other games, uh, first and foremost, the big one's going to be any language-based puzzles. Um, mm. If there's a thing, if there, you know, if a crossword pops up, then we're going to have to completely redo that. Um, and actually, then that becomes kind of a reverse issue in some points because um, we we have a big following, and sometimes we'll get people playing our games that are not native English speakers. So mm-hmm. then it becomes, and, and, and then in reverse, we have to kind of help them out with that, which is fine. Um, when it comes to a lot of the, the more physical puzzles, a lot of those can be brought over completely because um, it's more of an interaction. You have things in your hand, as long as that translates over. And, you know, we find that the Western audience really, you know, they really enjoy the, the physical interactive type of puzzles as well. Um, and then anything that, you know, if it's related with math, math is universal, don't have to worry too much about that. Um, it, but it also goes into the themes and the game flow. Um, so there's, we find that sometimes there are different levels of, you know, ability for, you know, suspension of disbelief and things like that. So how heavily do we have to theme a game? If it's a touring game, how, how much decoration do we have to do to really get people to feel immersed? Um, and if, it's, if there are main game mechanics, we want to make sure that it's going to be fun for Americans as well. Um, every now and then there might be something that we decide to, to tweak a little bit or maybe streamline for American audiences. What's a good example of that? I'm, uh, it's a poop joke. I know it. I know it already. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be a poop joke. Is Japanese. it a poop joke? I don't th- you know what? I don't think they even make poop jokes in the Japanese games. <gasps> which is oh. so unfortunate, right? <laughs> Defeated. So you, I, I, well, I'm very curious about the, and, and I'm not sure you can speak to this as much, the uh, playtesting process. Because at some point, there has to be some kind of weighing of, hmm, this is actually really, really hard to do in 60 minutes, or this is way too easy and we need to pump up the difficulty to, to make it more of a challenge. How does that work? Um, so there's uh, a couple different steps that we'll take. Uh, that's a really good question, by the way. Uh, and we will get the kind of the game to a certain, if you want to call it like an alpha, and then we'll do internally within our staff, um, we'll be able to do a play test. Because um, luck, one of the nice parts about being a larger company and um, having so many rooms, we have you know a good number of staff. We have part time, a lot of part timers mixed in with our full time staff. So we'll run a sample game, um, and then even then we have to keep in mind that we're all puzzle lovers. A lot of us came to the company because we just we love the product so much, and we've done a lot of these. So then we'll evaluate our performance kind of relative to how we feel our skill levels are, um, and then if it's uh, sometimes a room, but the, the big games especially, um, we'll do actually a public, like a bug test and trial run. And we'll, that'll be, you know, available. It'll be like the very, very first game. Um, it'll be, you know, often super cheap so that, because people understand that things may go wrong. You never know. Um, and then from there, we're able to make uh, a lot of tweaks uh, game by game to improve the flow. You know, was there an area that was congested or what did people just not understand? And can we, you know, if it's a, a certain puzzle, can we improve the instructions for mm-hmm. it? Or does the, because we also have um, what we call clue staff that are managing those games as well. And what can we adjust in how the clue staff interacts with each team to just kind of facilitate that process and make sure that, you know, we don't want nobody to escape. Our games are difficult. Um, we're one right. of the most difficult. 
Um, you know, and that's intentional. But we're not intentionally trying to keep every single person from escaping because that's that's not fun. Right. Do you have, but we do, you do want. Yeah, we want. Hmm? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna say we want it to be that really big accomplishment and that really awesome feeling of pride when you do manage to escape for your first time. Okay. I was just going to ask, do you ever get, uh, I don't know if you actually sit in and facilitate, but do you or your staff ever get just frustrated? Because I know when I was doing an escape room, the staff, the staff were very polite, but you could definitely tell they were like, look over here, look over here. Oh my <laughs> God, look over here. So I, is there ever that sense of like how are people not figuring this out or do you just kind of get used to it over time? Uh, well, I, I did facilitate the rooms a lot um, in the past because my, my, my journey into Scrap was I was a player and then I was volunteering and then part time okay. and then yeah came in full time. Um, but depending on people's patience levels, um, we see all types come in um, and it's not necessarily just the first time players, but you know, we want people to be respectful of the rules or mm -hmm. um, for the most part, though, it's it's not frustrating in the sense that we're frustrated at them. Um, mm -hmm. But because you're in there with the room and genuinely you want them to see this puzzle, you want them to escape and you're rooting for them. And it gets frustrating in the sense that you know where everything is and you know <laughs> that they don't. And it's just whether it's there's a number of you know reasons that'll stump mm -hmm. somebody uh, it could be like functional fix fixedness where you're not thinking of something else to do with an item or you're just glossing over something you've looked at eight times and i've seen it happen so many times um but the frustration is oh, really okay. because you, you you want them to do well and it's just it's really sad when you know they come out at a breakneck pace they're at record time at like 30 minutes in and then they just get stuck right yeah well do you I, so do you tweak the game at that point though to be like, all right, well, here's something where people keep getting stuck. And, you know, I, like, it's weird. You know, I, I think about, like, a video game is something that you have to test and test and test and test and test before people have their hands on it. And then you can, like, patch it and make sure it works differently after it's been released. But if you see something that's getting people hung up after they're, like, you know, going to beat it in record time, but, oh, there's this one thing that's really, really get a roadblock for them how do you go in and alter it do you do you make something more obvious do you make it you know do you do you take that step out of the process somehow what do you do um so by the time a room's been open for i'd say a few months for the most part it's pretty set um and, and it's gotten pretty balanced out there have been times when we will uh maybe add some kind of visual marker to something if because, um, you know, a lot of the times you'll find something in one corner of the room and it may go with something from a totally different area or two things that don't seem related. So um, we've, we've done instances of things like, yeah, adding a visual marker that suggests the relationship. Um, but a lot of those issues can be kind of resolved in the, the, the staffing. Um, mm -hmm. So it, I don't think it's, you know, really an industry secret or anything. But, and, you know, I mentioned we want everybody to have, you know, at least a minimum type of experience and something that is enjoyable. So there is control over the flow and that has been tested a lot over time. Um, and you can make, we can make adjustments to that, whether it's timing for certain things or um, how the staff approaches hints. Um, it's, it's pretty flexible actually. Hmm. Do you find that there's a certain kind of player, whether that's, you know, age or hobbies or what have you, that's, tends to be better at the game. Like we, because we want to feel good about ourselves, tend to think like, oh, well we play video games all the time and they naturally have tons of problem solving in them and they've got tons of puzzles. So we would be really good at an escape room. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> so yes, one would think um, in reality, it's really surprising and amazing to see the kinds of interactions that do happen. Um, so the Mysterious Room, our very first one, very, very difficult, one of our hardest games. Um, we've get, we get a lot of, because we're in the Bay Area, and we get a lot of Silicon Valley tech companies, right. engineers, all these sorts of people come in, um, and then sometimes they just fall flat on their face, right? Um, <laughs> and, and, and part of that is because our games, as I mentioned, you know, there are 11 people. 
and we, they are designed to encourage communication uh, oh. within the team because you cannot escape if you're all working independently and you have to kind of regroup and summarize and figure out what's going on, what have you been working on, how can I help, what are you stumped on, all those sorts of things. So mm -hmm. um, if you get people that are more used to a, like a solitary work style and they're not used to interacting on a team, they may have trouble. Um, at the same time, you know, we had a group of, I think it was 16-year-old high schoolers come in and they cleared the room. Ah. Just like yes. they just had no problem with it. Um, and then in another room that we had, uh, it was, it was, I think it was like a mixed family type of group. And the, the adults, there were kids and adults, the adults were super into it and they were trying to figure out all these puzzles and they had some of the kids and they were saying some things and there was a little girl who was, she said something and she suggested something and nobody listened to her. Mm. Um, and then they got down to where they had like 10 minutes left and it came up again and she had actually solved something that nobody listened to. Hmm. And so the team learned that day that you need to listen to everybody, no matter who they are, how old they are, you know, what they do for a living, all that sort of thing. So um, it can be really eye-opening in that sense. But every team is completely different, and it depends kind of just how you approach it. And it, it does help if you played before. I'll give you that. Well, sure, yeah, yeah. Of, of course. I saw a uh, psychologist was working uh, on pointing out to folks that maybe their communication skills were not as great as they believed them to be and put them in an escape room situation mm -hmm. where they had to figure out puzzles together and, and actually have give and take of, of ideas. And man, you will, you will not figure out faster that you are not all moving in the same direction. <laughs> <laughs> then if you oh my god until you are trying to figure out a bunch of puzzles together i think that was our we uh when we pre when i did it previously with some other staffers at games radar and at our sister site pc gamer that i think that was our big deal was we were trying to individually all work out these puzzles and weren't really thinking about how they go together we eventually did start thinking that way and we started working a lot faster but by then we'd spent so much time in the first section that we couldn't finish the last part so that was that was helpful to know to talk a little bit more and a little more frequently and think about how our different projects intersected instead of just let's solve this thing now this thing now this thing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us here uh, at 4:30 p.m. Eastern Time, welcome, welcome. You are watching Games Radar's weekly talk show. I got next, and today's guest is Doc Preuss, producer at Scrap Entertainment. Uh, and one of one of the great minds behind uh, the real escape room line of escape rooms, which are attractions where you're locked in a room and then tasked with escaping with a with a group, as we've learned, is is the ideal way to have to get the hell out of there. And we are playing right now Silent Hill Four: The Room, uh, an old school horror game for the PlayStation Two that is very much like being trapped in an escape room, but a crappy escape room. If you've been following <laughs> along for the past few minutes, you've probably noticed that I have absolutely no idea where to go. And the problem there is I'm not like one of the people in Doc's rooms where they're just totally missing a clue. Part of the reason that this game is not remembered very fondly is that it, it, it requires you to do things in a very oblique order. Like, if you don't look through a peephole in the wall that you can't even see with the naked eye, then this story sequence won't trigger, and then you won't be able to get to the next part of the game. Uh, and, Doc, you've been, you've been telling us about how people get past hurdles in your situation uh, with your escape rooms and, and the things that you require to, to make sure they get through. And, like, you were talking about how teamwork is a huge part of that. Whereas somebody playing this be playing by themselves. What other tricks do you guys use to draw people's attention to what they actually need to do? Like, you don't want to put a giant red arrow over, like, the key is over here! But how do you, how do you, how do you sort of lead people down the path? Or that would be a really awesome fake out. Right? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. That, oh, that'd be brilliant. Uh, yeah, so for us... Uh... A lot of it is in that we don't, you know, the, the setting and the set design and all that is important, 
um, and you want to set the mood and make it immersive. But we also, we don't necessarily have a lot of extraneous objects. Um, a lot of the, the items in the room will have a purpose. Um, so part of that is just not, not too many, you know, I played games that they have a whole bunch of red herrings and that can be super frustrating, um, especially if it's in there just for the purpose of distracting you and extending the time that you're wasting. Um, mm -hmm. So oppositely, we, we try to keep things a little more concise and more clean in our game design. Um, we would rather have people kind of, you know, taking turns working on a puzzle, trading off, looking around the room again, looking for clues that they might have missed, rather than spending 20 minutes looking at a jar that they think there's something in there, but you just aren't sure. Right. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a matter of more just giving everybody something relevant to do um, and getting them to talk about what they're doing and when they're having trouble, you know, that's a tip. Definitely switch off if you're stuck on something for too long. Uh, it's always sad when people come out of a room and they said, oh, I was working on that math problem for 30 minutes and I'm so frustrated. Oh. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's divide and conquer and always communicate with your team and all those sorts of... It sounds like common sense when you're not in the room, but once you get in there, all logic flies out the window and it's so hard to remember <laughs> what you're supposed to be doing. Doc, you were talking about how you sort of came into this because you started out as a fan. You were into doing these. What was, what was your history? How did you... What was your first escape room experience? Good question. So, um... I actually I came to Scrap actually from the games industry, um, and during my time over there, you know I, I actually played some Silent Hill 4. I didn't complete it, I have to admit. Um, but the the first the first game I ever played was the Escape from the Haunted Ship, um, and that was the one that was on the, the SS Jeremiah O'Brien. It's up at Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. Oh, so wow, the, nice. yeah, the venue was a huge draw for me and. I was like, uh, an escape room on a ship that's in the water? Yes, please. I so. know. It tells me that I can't go do it. <laughs> when are you going to bring it to the East Coast, man? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the haunted ship specifically? Well, yeah. I mean, I would start with that. We have a, a marvelous battleship down here uh, off the coast of North Carolina. But just, you know, I'm not greedy. I'll take what I can get. Just bring something to the south, man. Okay, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. We're always looking at uh, new markets to hit into. Actually, uh, the Chicago game is our first time in the Midwest, so we're super excited oh, for that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, but uh, so I, I went into that, um, you know, and to be honest, I thought it was the more traditional escape room, and even though it turned out to be a real escape game. So I, I was in the cargo hold of this ship. I was playing with probably 10 other teams, something like that. Um, my group, we got split up, so it was four of us, and we had two people two total strangers at our table, because the teams are six people. Um, and it turned out that they were veterans. They had played games before. And it turned out to work really well, because they kind of, they knew the ropes, and they kind of gave us tips. They directed us, you know, to try to escape. Did not escape, got super, super, super close. We're sitting there trying to figure it out. Um, so I was, kind of, I was kind of hooked from that point. Kept doing the big games, and then I tried the rooms as well. And I was just kind of, consuming everything Scrap was putting out because, um, you know, at that time they were the only ones there. And um, plus the game design is the most solid in my experience. Our puzzle design is excellent, I would say. Um, and then, you know, I really wanted to be part of this. So I, I hit up one of the owners and I was just like, hey, LA, I really want to, this is so cool. I want to help you guys out. Um, so I started volunteering with them. And then after some time, I went part time and I was traveling with them for events. And, um, and then after a while, they were like, hey, do you want to work with us full time? And I was like, I thought you would never ask. So they're um, like, hey, you've kind of been stalking us for years. So right. But, you know, it's it's really awesome when your company is kind of full of super fans and we yeah. have a lot a lot of our people. They do have other jobs and they work with us part time. Um, and everybody's just trying to support and, you know, really make these things happen because we just, we love the game so much. So that's a really cool part about Scrab. Doc, when, you know, uh, why do you think it's been, like, why have escape rooms been booming in the past couple of years? I felt like there, there was sort of, it went from, you know, zero to 60 in no time in the United States. I felt like there was this moment where nobody had any idea what an escape room was. Mm -hmm. Except for like you know Japanophiles, and 
Then all of a sudden it was like Conan O'Brien is doing a bit on his late night show where it's like, oh, we're going to do an escape room live. And I, so what, what happened? Like, why did it just sort of explode? Uh, I think part of it is it's, it's an extension of, you know, all the media that we, we've come to know and love. It's for us, because we're doing these live adventure entertainment, it's a step beyond the storybook because you read the story and, you know, you have your imagination and there's the protagonist, but in our games, you are able to become the protagonist. You're the hero. Mm. Um, and that's something that, you know, seems to be really appealing. And, you know, on another end of the spectrum, if you think about, I've got a group of friends, we want to do something, what can we go do that isn't going to drink at a bar? What can we do that isn't, you know, all these kind of very traditional hangouts and things for larger groups? And so I think when we started offering another alternative that was also this very engaging, you know, and also mentally stimulating kind of experience, and you, it's a shared team experience. People leave and they're talking about it and talking about puzzles that they did that somebody else didn't know about and they'll go to dinner afterward or they'll go get drinks afterward and they're still talking about it. Um, I think those types of experiences are kind of not getting a resurgence but people I think are really identifying with those experiences and, and realizing they want more of that sort of group shared you know highs and lows and you know uh, tackling something together. So I think that's it's really been resonating with people over the past, I would say, year, year and a half. Do you think it also has anything to do with now that so much of our entertainment is digital and on demand, I want to watch a movie at 3 o'clock in the morning and boom, it's on my television, that people want something in a physical space, a tangible, they, they you know, once upon a time, if you wanted to be entertained, you had to leave the house, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like you had to be with other people. And we've really been moving away from that. Do you think just the desire to just kind of step away from all the tech has had any influence on that? Uh, I think that's true to an extent. At the same time, we get people who download every possible escape room game on their phone and they just want more and more. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> there, there, are, there are those kinds of people, but we are seeing... Um, and I've been seeing more articles about this where people are just, they want to pay for these new types of experiences where they're out and they're doing something new. Um, and it, the value that you feel from that sort of expenditure is, it's a different feeling than paying to stream a movie at 3 a.m., right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. That actually brings up uh, a point I, and I know a lot of members of our chat have been asking uh, how they get to do something like this. So what does an event like this cost? Uh, it's, it's a little bit variable, but typically it falls around 25 to 30 um, for a game. That's not bad at all. Yeah. Bad so yeah, if, if you're doing one of the rooms, um, the entire experience is, it runs around 90 minutes because we get you in there and then, because um, we also, we have MCs, we have a setup. Um, cool. You, know, you, you kind of learn about your team a little bit, you do introductions, um, then they set up the room, then you get locked inside, 60 minutes from that point, and then we always make sure to walk you guys through the solution. Um, oh, very answer, cool. Yeah, answer any questions you might have had, um, because you know we understand you can only play these games once in your lifetime, right. each one, and we want to make sure that you leave you know happy with your purchase, right? Definitely, the uh, the explanation is extremely helpful because the one time. The one time when we just couldn't do it, it would have been so frustrating to walk out of the room n having no clue where we messed up. So it's very, it's very nice to have that background to just say, well, here's how you do, here's how you do it, and then you, it still feels enjoyable then, even if you got, even if you didn't make it, you know why at least. Yeah, definitely for sure. Do you know was that a scrap game or was that maybe somebody else? Um, I'm, I think it might have been a different one. It was like a magical forest, and we were trapped there by a witch, and we had to go back through the time portal, or we were going to be trapped. Does that sound something? Does that sound like one of yours, or is that someone else? We have a cursed forest game, but there's no time portal, so who knows? So okay. you were saying you have a time travel game. What? Can you, like, I mean, without spoiling anything, <laughs> how does the time travel room work? There is no DeLorean present, correct? There is no DeLorean present. Um, <laughs> so for that game, you are um, arriving for your tour of the time travel lab where... They've been studying time travel, and 
it's really hard to say anything without spoilers, but I can tell you it's pretty much the staff favorite. Um, so there are, you know, That's there's twi there are twists and turns um, without saying anything. There are very exciting moments in that one, and um, yeah, I can't say too much about that one. That's, <laughs> it's, it's, is that's, that what that's one of the. Favorite? That is, yeah, that is my favorite one still as well. Um, but we are we are opening um, uh, an Escape from the Jail game pretty soon, so we'll see how that one oh, turns perfect. out and see if that might take over my new favorite or not. Doc, you were also talking about how you know it, it was interesting to see like families go through the process of you know solving these things together and young teenagers going through together and sort of being really adept at teamwork and stuff like that. Uh, but you also talked about how, you know, one of the problems that you got to deal with is every now and again, the drunks come in and, and ruin everything. Uh, very rarely. <laughs> very rarely, everybody. We, we want you to know that you do not have to worry about roving bands of drunks. Uh, I, I am curious how you go about sort of designing for multiple age groups, though. You know, do you, do you have any rooms that are, like, adults only? You know, because you can deal with certain things thematically that you couldn't otherwise, and so on. You know, uh, or, or, or do you have any that are explicitly for younger audiences? And what are the sort of unique challenges for designing around that? Um, so I think the best example I could give, in terms of the rooms, um, they're pretty much... They're pretty much all all ages. Um, there is a certain point when um, you do get too young. Um, you know, starting right around the teen years and a little younger. Um, it, and every child's different, obviously. Um, but there are always you know some things that they can help with. Um, there may be puzzles that they they can definitely contribute to. Um, and then their kids are actually really good at offering off the wall ideas, unconventional ideas that sometimes are very relevant. Um, so we don't, in terms of like a kids only game, that's something that we are actually really interested in. It's not something we've tackled yet. Um, we've talked about doing something that is aimed more at kids and we would love to do maybe like a, a themed room, especially if it's a, you know, like with a property that um, people are really familiar with already. That is something that is one of our dreams that would be great to do. Um, but we had one game just recently. Um, it, it was a, it's an outdoor puzzle hunt. So we do it in conjunction. Um, there's an event called the J-Pop Summit that happens every year uh, up in San Francisco. So we collaborate with them, and we have the game running mixed in with this summit where all these vendors and stage shows and all these things are going on. And this year we decided to theme it about superheroes because who doesn't love a good superhero, right? Um, and so for that one, there's no time limit. You can take your time. You can spread it across the day. Um, we expected it. We designed it to be about two hours long total, um, but you can stop and have lunch at some point if you want to do that. So for that one, we we definitely toned it back, and we we wanted everybody to be able to escape. And so there was a lot of going back and forth um, in the design team, and reminding ourselves, no, this is too difficult. You know, who can do this, and is it accessible to everybody? So. That one we definitely scaled um, so that we could have more younger players, lots of families, super family friendly, and you know, the we decided it was the right decision. Obviously, when we get families in there and they're little kids wearing you know Superman costumes and trying our little challenges and all those sorts of things. So um, yeah, we do like to kind of cater to everybody if possible, but at the same time we only have so many resources and you know have to pick and choose your games carefully. Zach, tell me a little bit more about the design team. Like, I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what the, the makeup of your group is. Like, do they, do they come from a game design background? Do they, do they come from an engineering background? Where, where, or like a, a playwriting background? I, I would imagine, like, you need a, a flair for the theatrical to, to sort of really put together an awesome escape room. You know, who, who's on your crew? Uh, that it, that's going to change depending on each game. It's kind of a project-based uh, approach. Right. So typically, it's it's one or two main puzzle designers. So they're going to handle all the puzzles and make sure that the puzzles are varied and of different types, so that they, you know, appeal to different strengths and different personality types. Uh, and then you're going to have a main set designer who's going to handle the look and feel of everything. Typically, 
like our our main set designer right now is a really good guy. Uh, he's also you know illustrator, does great drawings, very artistic type. Um, so and then we've got you know we'll have a graphic designer that handles things like the promotional materials and the posters. Uh, and then actually for so out on top of the design team, um, another nice thing about Scrap is that we'll we'll open up brainstorming sessions and we'll run ideas past all of our you know part time staff and. Because you never know who's going to have a really awesome idea, so um, it's super collaborative in that sense. But the core team itself, you know, it's, it's going to be kind of one, one or two people from each of those kind of core disciplines, hmm. and then you're all you're all working together to make sure the design and the flow is cohesive and makes sense for what we're trying to accomplish. Man, that is cool, uh, Susan. You know hmm. what I just realized? What's that? Silent Hill Four is awful. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this game sucks. Here's the thing, if you just stayed, in, if this was an actual Escape the Room game... If it was game, just the room! It'd the be room amazing! It would be so great! But instead, I'm like, I'm sitting here, Doc, and I'm listening to everything you're talking about, about the, the sort of thoughtfulness that needs to go into making these rooms and, and making sure they work, and, and having these sort of like small, devoted teams making each single one, and I think to myself, God, I wish that level of attention was given <laughs> in this game. What? Well, what the hell with Silent Hill 4? I guess here's a, here's a question for you then. Because um, one of the things that when we, when we start the design process, um, one of the questions we will actually ask ourselves is, what emotion are we mainly trying to evoke? That is great. So, yes, that's and, a great place and you to start. Right, and you have to keep that in mind the whole time you're doing the design. So I guess in Silent Hill 4, what emotion do you think they were trying to evoke with this one? See, I think, like, I get the impression looking at this is that they thought to themselves, oh, well, our previous horror games are, uh, you know, very much about sort of capturing dementia. Like, you you are going through this, this horrible manifestation of your deepest emotional anxieties, and they're manifesting in the real world. And this, like, I, I feel like they're sort of trying to go with that, that feeling of confinement and confusion, but confinement and confusion with no clear way to go forward just results in frustration. Like, th like all of the signifiers that I usually rely on, in a video game at least, to indicate some kind of forward progress, like here is just a little piece of what you need to do. Like I need something, something there. Not like a tutorial, I don't need the giant red arrow saying go this way, but I need like something to provide me with a clear path forward to mitigate that feeling of frustration so that the other pieces of sort of the atmospheric qualities will come forward. And I can imagine, like, if I walked into an escape room, I would want a little bit of frustration because that would make, like, the, the ecstasy of the solve meaningful. But at the exactly. same time, like, you know, I, I would imagine, you know, I had asked you earlier, <clears throat> like, how do you sort of lead people along that path? Uh, yeah, I, I think the people that were making this were trying to do something that they... Failed freaking miserably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's one of the strengths of the the physical escape room genre, because um, you've got this game, and it could be twelve to twenty hours, but in a room where you have you know it's sixty minutes, um, and we definitely we we design a build up right, um, and making sure that there's a certain flow at certain markers, you know, and, you know, at, at this point in the game, what do we want people to feel? At this point in the game, what do we want them to feel? And then you just build up all that emotion so that you have a really awesome kind of, you know, climax and ending to it. So unfortunately, you can't do that with a long game. Yeah. Uh, Doc, what kind of audio elements are there in your escape room? Because like, you know, that's, a, that's something that horror video games and escape games in general, I think, especially like on phones, do really, really well. I love like just the mild sound effects that you get in an escape game and sort of the ambient music that usually goes with them. It creates this great atmosphere. Is there a soundtrack? Is there music in the room in Scraps rooms? Um, so to an extent, uh, first off, we, we have a theme song, which is pretty awesome. Nice. Uh, but so we have kind of, uh, it's kind of an ominous, type of music that's usually played um, kind of when you come in um, and then we'll play something just closer to the end of the game um, because you know things are getting tense uh, in terms of other audio sometimes we'll do videos um, and the videos will have their own audio track 
But we'll we'll do um, audible timing timing counters like 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, but beyond that, we we really don't want to kind of detract from the communication of the team, um, and you know distract them too much. So typically, it's pretty light on audio, I would say. And then once whether you know once you escape, if you escape or if you know you escape after being given the solution, then we'll play our theme song and it's super happy and fun. And <laughs> that's kind of the that's kind of the note you leave on. And then we'll you know take your team photo and you know make sure everybody's. Uh, happy before they go out the door. Is it a vocal theme song? Are there lyrics? There are lyrics. It's a full-on nice. band. Yep, yep. <laughs> I love that. that is it's great. all in Japanese, though. Oh. <laughs> do, you, do you find that, like, you know, is there a segment of your audience that is there because, like, they know that Scrap is a Japanese-based, you know, sort of gaming experience? Or, or like, do you get, like, the hardcore Japanophile like cosplay culture group. Um, the cosplay those that type of group tends to come in more um, when we do you know like our Attack on Titan game or the Evangelion game um, where there's already that appeal built in. Mm -hmm. um, bes besides that, and you know we we've talked to you know our our people that come in regularly, and there there's a fairly small percentage that kind of, you know, identify with that culture. Um, but we get a lot of just really hardcore puzzle people. Um, in the Bay Area, you know, people are always looking for these kind of stimulating experiences. And, and then we built a lot of our, you know, our super fans. And every game that we go, every tour that we do, I will recognize people. And it's like, oh, hey, welcome back. And it's always really nice to see them. So it's kind of like, try us once, get hooked. Um, and then we even see, we, people follow us across cities. Really? Uh, we had, oh wow! Yeah, uh, so I remember we went down to LA, and I recognized people from San Francisco. Uh, people came up to Seattle when that played with us in San Francisco, and then uh, just in New York, we actually had a team that they're like, "Oh yeah, we played these three games in San Francisco." I don't know how they follow us if they come fly out just for us or not, or what's going on, but it's it's awesome when it happens. That'd be pretty great if it's like, we just came to see you guys. We're just following you. We're following you from coast to coast. We will follow you across the universe. That must feel good. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely the hope. So when you do a licensed uh, game, like an Attack on Titan or an, an Evangelion, do they approach you or do you approach them? Because, man, a Professor Layton room oh, would be sad. awesome. Oh man, Susan, that, is, that so is so weird. I was literally just about to ask the same thing, but I was gonna say Resident Evil instead of Layton. Oh, Resident Evil would be great too. <laughs> so, so I Nintendo guess I'm being level, level, I was gonna. Yeah. Oh, I was, I was saying I'm uncreative. I was gonna ask about a Silent Hill room, but. <laughs> oh. I don't know if that now is the right time to approach Konami about that, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, good uh, point. Uh, yeah. Ooh. Good so, point. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and hopefully Nintendo and Level 5 are listening to these type of requests. But um, typically, I would say um, it's usually the, the partner that will approach us, um, especially, you know, Japan is pumping out collaborations left and right. Um, and that's something, actually, personally, I'll be focusing on for the upcoming year. Um, we have a lot of really good ideas, and we're talking to some partners. Um, and hopefully we can bring something very cool very soon. Um, and it's funny that you mentioned Resident Evil. Uh, the the Japan team has been running. Uh, it's not running right now, but at Universal Studios Japan, there is an attraction that is Resident Evil themed. Oh, yes, uh, there is. Yes, yeah, yes. it's yes, it's called Biohazard: The Real. It's amazing. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think they're on their second or third iteration. I tried to get in last year, and the tickets were already gone by the time I got to the door. Oh, uh, brutal. But for there was a limited engagement. I think it was a few months, and we did Biohazard: The Escape. Oh, um, cool! And it was, it was a scrap-developed escape game in Universal Studios Japan in collaboration with Capcom. I think it was up to like a hundred people at once. In and you're just trying to survive and escape this very terrible situation. Oh, that's so um, cool! Yes, and that's obviously something we would love to bring here. Um, you know, the more requests we get, and the more people that are talking about it. Yeah, we're you know I definitely want to do more and more collaborations in the U.S. Um, and also we have other goals that we're reaching toward because we we really want to go to Alcatraz as well. Oh wow! Oh, yes, wow, yes. Yes. Cool. yes, yes. So we you know we need people to be talking about us and sharing about us and um, it's these word of mouth type of things that have helped us to grow as it is. So 
really looking forward to 2016, and I, I hope we can announce some things in the near future. Doc, would you go about, like, approaching... How do you get space for these things? What's that noise? You know, you, you mentioned, like, yeah, we want to do Alcatraz, but I, I can imagine when you are going to, like, lease some space to set this up or rent, that the, the, like, the property owners are probably like, you, you want to do what? You want to... <laughs> huh? Like, what? You're trying... You want to trap people in a room and force them to try to escape? I think that's called kidnapping. Nah. They like it. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, like, are there, are, I mean, does, do you guys own any of your properties, or do you have to sort of go through some weird hoops to adapt existing spaces to your needs? Uh, you know, we typically lease, and the, the, you know, approaching a space or them approaching us, uh, it's going to vary by the venue. Uh, we had, you know, somebody kind of, we've had a couple of people approach us recently, more kind of typical um, sometimes it's like an office space kind of deal and you do have to do permits and zoning and all that sort of thing. Um, but usually if we're approaching somebody, they're likely familiar, um, with the genre. And if they're not, then, you know, we'll invite them over and have them play and that sort of thing. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not, it's, it's more of a leasing kind of situation. And then the really, really cool venues, um, usually those are the real escape game style. So they're the limited engagement. Maybe it's one weekend or it's a week or two weeks um, where we're kind of working with the owners of that space um, to utilize it for a game. And then, you know, after that, it, it, it's unfortunate, but the limited events are, are a lot of fun and we're able to do them in special venues, but they're typically not permanent. Yeah. Uh, are, are, have you had any opportunities to bring over, you know, something you're talking about like Biohazard the Escape, which would be so awesome? but, you know, complicated to bring over because then you have to deal with Capcom and all that. Is there any opportunity to bring over something that might have been licensed and then just strip it of the license but still use that room design? That, so when we have partners and we're using their IP, oh. um, it's super important, you know, to maintain the integrity of the IP, but also... To have the most engaging experience, a lot of those puzzles and things are going to be designed around the IP. So I feel like trying to strip things out would be probably really, really difficult. Because hmm. our game design you know, focus is that we want everything to make sense. We want it to be cohesive. And if somebody has trusted us with their IP, we want to make sure that we're not you know, abusing it in any way and we want it to be super uh, integrated into the game. Right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have only a few minutes left here on the stream today. Uh, if you have occasionally seen me looking up on camera, that's because I'm, I'm experiencing my own little horrific scenario. There is an enormous bug that has been walking up my ceiling ah! for the past half hour. And it just Not keeps, cool. it's always in eyesight and it's really, really horrible, but I've just been sort of persisting because it's cultivating pretty much the exact mindset that I need for this entire it's endeavor. Uh, waiting for its moment to strike oh as, soon as, the te as soon as the screen is off, as soon as there are no witnesses. It's really, really big, too. Uh, <laughs> Not uh, cool. Not yeah, cool. Just really, really unpleasant. Uh, everybody, we have been joined today by Doc Preuss, a producer with Scrap Entertainment, and one of the guys who is bringing the real escape room, uh, escape game, line of escape rooms across the country. They're in Chicago, San Francisco, New York. Uh, I'm going to pop their website in the chat right now, and you can find out more details there. Doc, is there anything else you want to tell folks about uh, a real escape game before, before we sign off today? Uh, definitely at least try one, because once you try one, you're hooked, and make sure you try ours. Because uh, every company's different, and we are special. And yeah, I mean, if you, if any of the viewers know people in Chicago, it's our very first time heading over there. We would love to see and make new fans and just meet the people out there. So um, definitely spread the word and hopefully help us get to Alcatraz and all other awesome locations. And if you have not already, I encourage you to follow us here on Twitch. Click that little heart button, and you will know whenever we go live. If you're excited. Uh, about more scary games and Halloween action in the future. We have a whole piping hot plate of weird Halloween stuff coming up. 
for you in the next week and a half. Next week on I Got Next, we're going to be joined by the hosts of one of my favorite podcasts in the world, Monster Talk, uh, from Skeptic Magazine. They are folks that bring on people who research cryptids and ghosts and monsters and look at their real-world inspirations and the reality of it. Uh, Spoiler warning, everybody. Loch Ness Monster, not a plesiosaur. If ever there was anything in there, that's not how their necks work. Plesiosaurs no. don't go like this. It doesn't, they don't have the bones for it. it doesn't work. They're going to be here next Tuesday, and we're going to be playing Fatal Frame. Uh, Fatal Frame, the Curse of the Black Maiden, Ashley? Uh, Maiden oh. of the Black Water. Maiden of the Black but... Water. Anyway, apparently it's not very good. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Doc, I, I hate I hate to disappoint you, man. Apparently, the new Fatal Frame. Not great, according to Ashley. Uh, I'm a huge That's fan of the it. series. That's too I bad. Know. But we're going to play yeah. it anyway. And we're going to have people who, who, talk, who talk to people who believe and debunk ghosts all about it. So that'll be next week. And uh, we've got some really, really exciting stuff for the rest of the week here. On Thursday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, we're going to have on the designer of a new horror game called Knocked, which is so cool. And then next week, we're going to have um, this guy, Frank O'Connor. He's the creative lead on a little indie game called Halo 5. Uh, not the big a little, just a, you just know, a, a little. Just a tiny indie game. So follow tiny us. Game. And we will we'll be we'll be we'll be here for you then. Thank you for watching, everybody. Yeah. Bye bye.